All right, everybody. I heard that there were some issues with lab last week. That's okay. Some small issues. Um, good news about this week is this being the week of the midterm means we're not adding any new assignments other than the practice midterm and last week's lab. So tomorrow during during class, I'll have a chance to finish up the lab procedure, um, get your numbers and get some practice with that. And heck, even on Wednesday, if you if you wanted to or if you still needed more time to finish stuff up, um, then uh, that's really we're not doing anything new this week, just practicing getting ready for the midterm, um, which, again, will be on Thursday. Um, I won't be able to be here. But um, Mr. Toms will be able to answer any questions you might have on the fly um, to, to some extent. And, but when in doubt, just if you have a question and, and don't know how to interpret a particular question or anything like that, there shouldn't be too much of that on this test um, because for the most part, this test is pretty straightforward. But just make a, you know, just make a note right now. I assume this because the inf I don't, there wasn't enough information or you know, occasionally on the stoichiometry problems, um, I have a, a uh, bad habit of sometimes changing the changing the numbers in the formulas down here and forgetting to change it up above. So if you ever if you run into any conflicting information or you think I made a might have made a typo, anything like that, just make a note. I I think what you meant was this. I'm going to answer the question like that. I just show me your logic. If you're unsure if there's any clarification, um, then you, I can give you as much credit as possible for those. And speaking of the the uh, practice midterm, anybody get a chance to look at it over the weekends? Looked at it. Okay. So there's a couple ways we can do a review. Um, we can just use it as time to work through this and and Mr. Toms and I can walk around and give people help where they want. You guys can ask me questions and I'll go through anything um, that you want about the, the practice test, including how grading works, big questions, things like that. Um, we can just do practice problems in specific areas. Um, so we'll start by just opening it up does anybody have any specific questions about the practice test? Anything they wanted to go through already? Sydney, I don't have any printed. No. Um, maybe we can get some. Hold that thought. Uh, okay, so question was about the nomenclature problem and solubility. So listen up, everybody. Uh, because I forgot that there was actually a solubility. So for the solubility rules provided, means I'm going to give you a copy of solubility rules. And if they're not on this page, then they're going to be in the um, supporting information, which maybe that didn't get included in this version. Um, I would give you... The, the version of the solubility rules from Wikipedia, Wikipedia solubility rules. So something like, no, not that one. What? There. Yeah. So, so this, this section right here, I'm going to include this 
these solubility rules in the or in the supporting information. I don't know how I must have copied and pasted from the wrong file that didn't have these included, but it's you know a list of what's soluble, including what the what the exceptions are and what's insoluble, including what the exceptions are. So the, if the question is so you, you specifically said silver oxide, Cindy? So let's go through how to use these solubility these solubility rules. There's our solubility rules, and we go back to the nomenclature part. So for, for the ionic compounds, like silver oxide, we would go over to the table and we would say, okay, silver oxide, are oxides generally soluble or insoluble? And right here, hydroxides and oxides are generally insoluble with the exceptions listed here. So we would say, okay, well, so it doesn't say anything about silver oxide specifically in the exception, so we can assume that silver oxide is going to be insoluble in water. Bowling? What is that? Well, group one means column one on the periodic table. When it says, anytime you see group, it means column. There's some old ways of naming the, the columns, but so that um, they group like a couple of the transition metal columns together, um, things like that. I just use the, the column numbers typically. So group one A means column one. And I'll change that on, on the version that I include on the test to, to just say column one. So it makes it clear. All right, any other questions about the structure of the test so far or about any specific parts? Okay. For this table, for instance, right? So big steps. Right. Correct. So, so sulfites are generally insoluble, sulfates are generally soluble. But it doesn't say anything about sulfites. Oh, no, it does down there. It means exceptions. Exactly. So, the exceptions mean that it doesn't fit with the rest of the trend. So, chlorides are listed as generally soluble, with the exception of these three. So, these three or these four are going to be insoluble. These ones will form a solid when you mix a hey, chloride with silver ions. These ones, the exceptions, these ones are generally insoluble. So the exceptions mean it is soluble. Exceptions just mean the opposite of what the normal case is, right? So you, the way that you use the table like this is just, okay, find what either, either the cation or the anion so, for instance, um, as sulfates, sulfates are generally soluble. So, if I say, okay, is is um, you know palladium sulfate soluble in water? We'd come down here. We'd say, okay, sulfates are in the soluble category. Palladium is not one of the exceptions. So, we would say that this is so that's would be soluble, and that's that's the way we use these solubility tables is effectively just to you use the general rules and then check if you have an exception. All right, and if it's an exception, that just means opposite of the normal rule. Any other questions on this or something else? Polarity. Polarity and stuff is perfect. I figured that's where we spend a fair bit of time today.
So these, this is uh, number five, I think, right? Yeah, page five. So it's kind of set up to lead you through the process a little bit because you have to do the Lewis dot structure. You have to know the, the molecular geometry to know if it's polar or not, right? Because you have to have asymmetry to know if it's polar or not. So you need the molecular geometry to know if there's asymmetry, and you need the Lewis dot structure to know the molecular geometry. So I would start on these working left to right. Just a note on how I grade these to, so people don't get too worried about this is if you make a mistake on your Lewis dot structure and then you base your answer to the molecular geometry on your wrong Lewis dot structure, I'm only going to mark you down for the first box. As long as you're consistent, I'm not going to mark you down three times if getting a wrong answer here led to a wrong answer the rest of the way through. I try to be as fair as possible with that. If um, if it's a multi-step problem like that. Vice versa, like if we did the first one wrong on accident and then get the molecular structure. So it cuts both ways though a little bit, right? If you get the Lewis dot structure wrong and you get the molecular geometry right based on a wrong geometry, I will mark you down twice because you're not being consistent with your own logic. Right? So if you have to guess on the Lewis dot structure. That's okay. Just be consistent with what you pick. Don't try to guess what the right answer was supposed to be. Go with what matches what you already done. Okay. All right. The way to get the worst possible score on this one is to be inconsistent within your own work. All right. So if we're trying to start here to figure out if it's polar or not, we would start with the Lewis dot structure. Then figure out the molecular geometry. And then what are the two criteria for, for knowing if it's a polar molecule? It's got to be asymmetric. It has to have, and it has to have polar bonds, exactly. So the way that I would, quote unquote, show my work for this one is after I did the molecular geometry, I would just write does it have asymmetry? Does it have polar bonds? And if you can say yes to both of those things, if you say yes to both of those, you can say it's a polar molecule. If you said no to either of these, you rewrite this since, again, talking while I write, leads to lots of typos. If you say yes to both of these, it's a polar molecule. If either of these is a no, then it's nonpolar. All right, so was there, was there one in particular you wanted to work through, Chloeline, or did you just want to know the process? Um, okay, so let's start by doing the Lewis dot structure. Carbon tetrachloride. So we'll start by putting carbon in the middle and totaling up our valence electrons, right? I shall erase these bonds so we can just do it the way we've done it in the past. So four times seven valence electrons for chlorine plus one times four electrons carbon gives us a total of 32 electrons, right? Or valence electrons. Start by putting our least electronegative element in the middle. So carbon in this case. Draw the bonds. We just used eight electrons, so now we're at 24 electrons left. Four chlorines, and each chlorine still needs how many? Needs an additional six on each chlorine, right? Six times four is going to give us 24. So we used all of our electrons. Does everything have a full valence? Does everything have its formal charge as low as possible? 
yeah, carbon making four bonds is going to have a formal charge of zero. Chlorine making one bond is going to have a formal charge of zero. You can just draw it, but it, but you need to make sure that the structure you draw is as low as possible for the formal charge. All right, so if there was a better Lewis dot structure, if you, if you got a Lewis dot structure, we'll, we'll look at it in the next one um, in a second. But remember that our criteria in order of importance is right number of electrons, um, full octets, full valences, lowest or formal charge closest to zero. Right, so if you can say yes to the first two questions, that's a two out of three points, right? If you, if you didn't get the last part, if, you, if there was a better formal charge or better way to make the bonds for your formal charge, keep them all closer to zero, and you missed it, that's minus, you know, probably a quarter of the points, maybe a third of the points on that part. So this one doesn't have any other options. So it's a, so we don't need to worry about this one. So what do we do for molecular geometry then? Count how many electron groups there are, right? How many things are taking up space around the chlorine? So four things taking up space around the chlorine. Tetrahedral electron geometry. Are any of them lone pairs? No. That means that our electron geometry and our molecular geometry are the same. So our molecular geometry is tetrahedral. So that's the first two boxes on our problem over here, right? On our test. I left lots of space for molecular geometry so that if you can't remember the word tetrahedral or whatever the struct the molecular geometry is, you can draw it. You just have to show approximately the right bond angle. We talked about that, right? If you are mixed up on the name, you can draw it as long as you can give me the right shape, including using the wedges and dashes to show stuff coming out of the board or into the board. So another full credit answer for this, for the molecular geometry here would be to draw it like that. They're used for a tetrahedral shape. If you picture, there we go. I knew I just saw one of these. If you picture a tetrahedral geometry, if you set it so two of them are flat in the plane of the board, the other two are pretty much on top of each other. One coming out, one going in. You see how, and that then it looks more or less like you took a circle and you cut it into thirds with the bonds, right? So sometimes we do draw the one, one coming out of the board a little bit more downward facing, but that's just to give ourselves enough room to write stuff. Really, they're pretty much on top of each other. Does that make sense? I want it close. It's there's a little. It's a little bit like the spelling question. It's I'm gonna have to use some discretion on that. And you know, if you did something qualitatively wrong with the bond angles, like if you took, if you took the one that's sticking straight out that's supposed to be on top of this one, and you put it up here, that's not right all of a sudden, right? Yeah. 
that I'm get, definitely going to mark you down for. But if it's a little bit off of 120 degrees or a little bit off of 109 degrees, I'm not going to get out a protractor and measure. I right, just be close. It should be obvious that it's not 90 degrees though. Yeah. Makes sense. All right. So all of this just to show that we're trying to say if this is polar, we need to know what the geometry is, right? Does it have polar bonds? A lot of times polar bonds is faster to check than asymmetry. It's a little bit easier to wrap your head around. And if it doesn't have polar bonds, you don't even need to say, worry about asymmetry, right? So we need to check to see if it, there's polar bonds and a reminder that the um, equation sheets at the back have electronegativities, the most common elements there. So on the screen, it's rotated, but carbon with an electronegativity of 2.55 and fluorine of 3.16. That's a big enough jump to make it a polar bond, right? Where's our cutoff for where when the bond becomes polar? About 0.4. Remember to use carbon and hydrogen as sort of your mark your demarcation line. If it's a bigger difference than carbon to hydrogen then it's a polar bond. So carbon, carbon to hydrogen is 2.2 and 2.55. So about 0.35. It's a bigger jump than that between your, your um, elements. Then that means it's a polar bond. So we do have polar bonds here. And 3.6 or less, or 0.36. Oh, a difference of 0.36 or less is going to be a non-polar bond. So then the question is, if we do have polar bonds, the other criteria, criterion, is does it have asymmetry? Does this molecule have asymmetry? No. So yes, it has polar bonds, but no, it does not have asymmetry. Therefore, it's non-polar. What's that? OK, so how do you know it has asymmetry? Was that your question? So let's, let's talk about asymmetry again. Because that, that is the trickiest thing to, to look at, right? If you have a geometry, a molecular geometry, that is identical to one of your electron geometries, so no lone pairs, basically, if everything around the central atom is the same, it's going to be a symmetrical molecule. So it's less about symmetry, like, can I draw, can I put a mirror and have it be the same on both sides of the mirror or anything like that. It's more about is everything that's taking up space and pulling on electrons the same and evenly spaced. And as long as all of your, all of your atoms attached here, all of your electron groups are identical to each other, it's going to be symmetrical. You only get to asymmetry if one of these is not the same. As soon as one of them is not the same as the rest, it's asymmetric. And that, and that includes lone pairs. So if you have at least one lone pair, it's going to be asymmetric. And so, for instance, Only when you get to octahedral and trigonal bipyramidal. If you if you get to five or six electron groups, you you can wind up with your lone pairs being exactly 180 degrees apart from each other, and that makes the molecule symmetric again. But in general, 
you're going to, if you have one lone pair, it'll be asymmetric. And as long as you're tetrahedral or below in terms of your number of electron groups, it doesn't matter how many lone pairs, as long as you have at least one lone pairs, it's always going to be asymmetric. Do you have to remember what they look like or what their names are? Um, no, we haven't really talked about that much, but we talked about it a little bit because Simone asked a similar question. I think it was Simone asked a similar question about how can they ever cancel each other out um, when it comes to the asymmetry. It's basically if you happen to have trigonal bipyramidal and you had three lone pairs around around um, a central atom, they're going to arrange themselves so that they're all in those in the trigonal positions, which means they're going to which leaves these two to cancel each other out. So it's less about the lone pairs canceling each other out, and it's more about um, getting these if these can ever cancel each other out. In a trigonal bipyramidal, anytime you have an even number of lone pairs, you're going to wind up with them still being symmetric. Um, but those are the the only cases, and I don't. I don't plan on that being something that throws off your answers. This is odd, but this is also not octahedral. So for octahedral, it's an even number of lone pairs. And for trigonal bipyramidal, it's specifically three. It only happens when there's three lone pairs, because that's the only way you can get them to be exactly opposite of each other. So this would be symmetrical. This is symmetrical. If there are two lone pairs, then no. Yes, these are 180 degrees and canceling each other out, but nothing's canceling out this one. And so most of the time, lone pairs mean asymmetry. There's only there's a very few exceptions, and I don't plan on that being the make or break decision for these problems. It's always a possibility that I forget or ask a question that is more intense than I meant it to be. Um, that's not usually what I'm doing when I'm writing a test. That would be a mistake on my part. So it's really just looking for asymmetry. Asymmetry in any axis. Um, exactly. So basically, if remember that, think of these as being tug of war. And lone pairs don't participate in tug of war. They're not bonds, right? So if these ones are canceling each other out, playing tug of war, and nothing is canceling this one out, then it's going to wind up pulling everything this direction. Now that we know what the terms are, is there anything tricky about polarization or um, hybridization? So all that I'm looking for for hybridization is SP whatever. If it's linear electron geometry, then it's going to be um, SP. If it's trigonal planar, you have three electron groups, you need to mix three orbitals together. So that'd be SP2. You guys remember that, right? And how it really is just like a one-to-one -one translation of how many electron groups you have taking up space, right? So if you already have your Lewis thought structure, a full credit answer on hybridization for this one would literally just be writing SP3. That's all I'm looking for is do you know those terms? And we get the hybridization after the SP3. And then you start mixing in the d orbitals, right? So you should. This is a good way to double check your work on these ones. You should never have anything with more than eight electrons, unless what? Unless you're in the third row of the periodic table, because then you have an empty d orbital that you can start mixing in. D or or the third row or lower, right? So something that has a trigonal bipyramidal shape 
like the one we were just looking at, the theoretical one, doesn't matter. We have five electron groups on this atom, right? So that means it's it's electron geometry, trigonal bipyramidal or bipyramid. The molecular geometry would be what? T-shaped. And the hybridization, yeah. So if it was one lone pair, then it would be seesaw. And the hybridization We have five things taking up space. We need five orbitals hybridized together. So that's S gives us our first one. P, three, that gives us four out of our five. So we need one more orbital to mix in. So we added part of a D orbital, one piece of a D orbital. So that would be your full credit answer for hybridization for this would just be SP3D. When you're bonding with xenon, yeah. can you, you don't have to take more than Eight electrons and it, it put the lone pairs on Correct. Because it has D bond. So really anything, and that's why we don't start seeing any noble gases make any bonds until after you get past argon, really. You can get noble gases to make bonds. Even argon's a little tricky. Argon can make um can make covalent bonds because you can you can break the octet rule with argon, but really you don't start seeing it more until krypton and xenon. Um, and, but that's what allows it to, to do that. That's because the orbital is so big that it can not, why, why is that? Why does that have to be past argon? I, so anything from the third row and down can make can break the octet rule. Um, but argon actually, if you get a more complete electronegativity, chart, it actually has electronegativities for the noble gases. And argon is just a little bit too good at holding its own electrons in close to itself. As you get further down the noble gases, krypton and xenon, and have, yeah, that greater distance and more shielding from the nucleus. Um, and so you're able to make those covalent bonds. They have a little bit weaker electronegativity, um, which can let something like fluorine come in and, and bully it around. Any other questions on, on this part? Yeah. Any other questions on any other part? Any types of problems in particular? Um, just one question. What about writing the um that's a good question I, I, just heard the formula. I would say either either is fine so the question is for for uh, this is number two um where it says for each acid write the conjugate base and then for each base write the conjugate acid um it doesn't specify formula or name so either one is fine mm -hmm. So for hydrochloric acid, if you just wrote chloride or if you wrote Cl minus, either one would be the correct answer. All right. So remember, conjugate base is what what do you get after something has given up an H plus? So for conjugate base, you're just going to take an H plus away from whatever molecule I give you, whether it was something you would name as an acid or not. <clears throat> and for anything that's a, acting as a base. If it's acting as a base, it's accepting an H plus, right? It's accepting a proton. If it's accepting a proton, the conjugate acid is what you get when a base after the base has accepted the proton. So it's basically going to be what you started with with an extra H plus. And for all of these acting as an acid, it's going to be what you started with minus an H plus. 
right? So knowing the names of your polyatomics, um, double check that you're not gonna trip yourself up with that. But in general, you know, we've done a fair bit of work on nomenclature. So I'm not testing you on the nomenclature specifically for this one. Um, we'll see how everybody does on nomenclature related topics on the test because we might bring that back if everybody tanks on that part. We need to go back and, and redo that. So even though I'm not testing you on the nomenclature specifically, I would go back and double check um, your, you know, give it a quick overview of that nomenclature packet. Make sure you're, you're up on that. All right. Anything in particular from at this point? Yeah. If, if a metal is there, are other things, so typically, you're not, you're you'll you'll be able to narrow it down one way or the other. You're not going to get a contradiction from the solubility rules. Because for the most part, most of the solubility rules um, are listed from the point of view of anions. Okay. And so you find your anion. The exception to that is group one and ammonium compounds are always soluble, no exceptions. Other than that, most of your polytom or most of your um, solubility rules are going to be the anions. But if it's like sodium phosphate. And we're looking at phosphate salt insoluble, except for one, which is sodium. So, so if we if it was sodium phosphate, we want to know if it's soluble or not. There's actually two ways to answer that one. One, we could look up here and, and see, okay, it says group one, soluble, no exception. The only exception is lithium phosphate. Over here it says phosphates are generally insoluble except group one, which also tells us the same thing. They match because this one's saying all phosphates are insoluble except for group one. And this one is saying all group one is soluble except for lithium phosphate. So sodium phosphate, looking at this, sodium phosphate is going to be soluble. If and if you want another way of thinking about this, and I'm open to using this version of solubility rules. So, hang on one second. Oh, yeah. Oh, that must be the new page. Hang on. All right, so this is another way of thinking about solubility rules. It's basically, all you do to use this version is you find the right combination. So your anion goes down the side, and your cations go across the top. So you just, this, this isn't as commonly used because it takes up a whole page as opposed to a little chart that's, you know, can be pretty tiny on a page. Um, so in the interest of, of not taking up too much space, um, you don't see it shown like this this much. But this is basically what solubility rules is telling you the same thing as those solubility rules. It's just being more explicit. Instead of saying, oh, chlorides are generally soluble with a few exceptions, it actually lists out chloride. Soluble, 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 until you get to silver chloride. And then it says insoluble. So slightly soluble, remember we talked about saturation point for compounds, right, in, in a solvent. Um, turns out when we say insoluble, we don't actually mean 100% insoluble. 
We just mean that it's saturated at a very, very low concentration. So slightly soluble means you can dissolve it a little bit, but not very much. It's usually you have to, to work to get it to dissolve either by, by heating it up um, or generally by just heating it up is the most common way. Um, but that's one of the reasons why I probably won't use the version of this because we're going with, with the binary. It's either soluble or not. I'm glad you asked. The blank spaces are really interesting, actually. I was asking myself the same question when I showed the uh, Gen Chem students this version of solubility rules. Um, typically, the blank spaces happen because if you make that particular combination, you actually get a redox reaction instead of a precipitation reaction. So if you mix chlorate with iron two, you actually wind up oxidizing the iron two to iron three and you get something else happening instead. And you, uh, you would probably turn, so if the iron's being oxidized, the chloride will be reduced and so you'll wind up taking it from chlorate to chloride probably and, re and releasing some oxygen or something like that. So basically all the blank spaces are where other usually redox reactions would get in the way from actually doing that as a precipitation reaction. But again, that's probably, those are some of the reasons why I'm not gonna give you this version of the chart because this gives you a lot more information, but it's too much information with, in some respects. I just want you to be able to see, this is what your solubility rules are actually representing is a chart like this where they actually just went through and they tried every combination and they made a list of what stays dissolved and what doesn't. How are we feeling? Should I? cut you loose to work on this practice test and then I'll come around and answer questions as they come up. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's do that. Yeah. Um, uh, we can work through that. I don't have it offhand, but let me, let me what up, yeah. Need a question. Because I don't know if I did it right because we, we did like all right. So we have the two possibilities, right? It's either yeah. M2SO4 or it's MSO4 plus. Uh, you know what min i do actually know i do know the answer here um because yeah it, it winds up it has to be potassium right because the other option winds up being in the middle of the transition actually i think it's in the non-metals right yeah so that it can't be that. So it has to be potassium. Okay. But yeah, that, so you got the right answer, which means, and you couldn't have gotten there without getting the right math along the way. So okay. um, I think you're good to go just, on that one. Um, just this. Just I don't get how to find the snap. Like, I so can I use like potassium? To figure out the percent by mass mm -hmm. of sulfate. So if you know you've got 0. 0.433 grams here, uh -huh. you can turn that to moles, right? which um, your molecular weight of the barium sulfate, 233.3? Yeah. Six. Six. 
And then the other thing we can say is if <clears throat> we can say, okay, well, for every one mole barium sulfate, that's one mole of sulfate by itself, right? So, and if we know that how many moles of, of sulfate we have, we can say we can just use the molecular weight of just the sulfate. It's uh, 96.06. Okay. What do you get? 0. 0.7. Oh, I did it. I got another right one. There you go. Okay, yeah, so you just, if you know that this is the total, uh -huh. And you can figure out how many moles of sulfate are in that. You can figure out how many grams of sulfate. Okay. And then that gives you how many of this are left over. Well, then we have to multiply by 100. And then, uh, okay. yeah. Because what I did is I find the molecular weight of mm -hmm. potassium sulfate. Mm -hmm. Then I divide by um, the weight of um, the, because part of a whole is a mm. part of yeah. SO4 over the whole thing. I got 55 on that. But 3,500 of that is like, in, assuming it's 100 gram of. Right. So you did it in the opposite order. Yeah. This then, one, but if you didn't want to have to find the molecular weight first, yeah. then the next thing you could do is say, okay, well, go through this, divide by 0.323, use this your total. Yeah. Okay. And do your part divided by your total times 100. That's great. So, hey, Haley. Hi. When adding um, the rule for significant figures is just the mm -hmm. same amount of decimal. As the yeah, least, as, the limited, okay. as in the so out of these, just like you just say, to the so this one is plus or minus a minute, right? Yeah. This is plus or minus a hundredth of a minute. So which of these is less certain? So it'd be one forty-six. Yeah, more sense. We want to make that more stable, we need to give it more electrons, right? So, how could you rearrange those to give it more electrons? Exactly. Well, that's the exact same thing as a Right, so right now you're here. But that's a minus one, and this is a plus one. But if we do this, now this is a zero. This is also a zero. So this, this is the full credit answer. Leaving it like this, that's the two out of three. I don't 
So you just you literally just start counting the electron Derek and Aspen. Hey, Aspen. You want to work for the hydrogen? All right, so smallest number we can have is two electron groups, right? If you have two electron groups, what's the geometry look like? They're going to arrange to be opposite of each other, right? The 180 degrees between them. Yeah. What do we call that shape? Linear. 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 So if there's two electron groups, the electron geometry is linear, and the hybridization only needs two pieces. So it's S. So it's S P. It's SP. It's just S P. One part S, one part P. Three electron groups. What's the shape? Trigonal planar. And what's the hybridization then? Yes, me too. Good. It's it's literally that simple. And these these are all interchangeable terms. They always will be the same. If you have this many electron groups, this is your geometry, this is your hybridization. Okay. So four electron groups is the one that we just looked at, right? So tetrahedral. SP3. Five and six. And that's when you do the D. And that's when you mix in the D. So without remembering what the names are here, SP3, that gets us the first four electron groups. Add one more. Okay. So then what's our last one? SPD or SP3 D2. Bingo. Okay. How many more? That's what it's there, You can go past that a little bit. You can get up to seven electron groups, and I've seen eight electron groups. We won't have those on the it test. It won't be on the test, though. If it's, but the hybridization would, yeah, would just keep going. It would be SP3D3 or SP3D4. Okay. Right? So it's this process is really straightforward. It's just remembering the names of the yeah. shapes. It's actually harder. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Feeling better about that? Yeah. Cool. Yeah.
to double check your answer. Oh, <laughs> you <laughs> Five. 
Hey, I just want to call for you. Minus one. Uh, that means how many votes are on the Peter solution? It's the ratio. So. Okay, so you know how to figure out x. Yeah, it's actually really easy to do. Yeah. 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 